My lab is interested in is uh, how do animals make decisions? Now, what do I mean that by decisions? Take uh, this example, for, for example, take a bat that is uh, in its uh, roost uh, a few minutes after sunset. And this bat now has to make many decisions, decisions such as uh, uh, where to move, how to move. When I, when I say how to move, I mean to move alone, to move in a group, which trajectory to use. This was mentioned already in the previous uh, talk quite a lot. Uh, now, when making these decisions, the bat has multiple types of uh, uh, sources of information. It can use its own uh, uh, sensory information. It can use uh, information from uh, its uh, peers or from other bats, what we call social information. And it can also rely on uh, higher cognitive uh, skills or capacities such as memory, for example. So those we're try what we try to understand is how, can, how does a bat integrate these different types of uh, information into decisions which are usually measured by uh, movement. So I will start uh, by talking about uh, sensory information. This is also where I started. I, I uh, originally was a, a sensory ecologist. And the main reason for me to study bats is, is this, is echolocation. The fact that bats sense the environment through uh, sound emission. Uh, this is very interesting from the point of view of the animal, as I'll uh, elaborate in a second. But it's also very useful for me uh, as a scientist who wants to study animals in their natural environment. And that is because if you look, so what you see here, I, I guess I don't have to explain echolocation, right? Bats or, or biosonar, same, same. Bats emit sound. Uh, echoes are received. The brain processes these uh, echoes. And, uh, and many different types of information can be ex extracted. I will elaborate a little bit later. Uh, but when we look at a, a sequence of calls emitted by a bat, so this is a, what we call a spectrogram. You have frequency oh, over time. Each of these is an echolocation call. Uh, just by looking at this sequence of calls, I can say quite a bit about the behavior of the animal. Uh, you can notice, for example, how the signals change along time. The intervals between them become shorter. Their bandwidth increases. The duration of each signal uh, uh, decreases in this case. And this is because the bat in, in this point is attacking prey. OK, so I can say this just by recording uh, the bat. If I have an array of microphones, such as in an acoustic uh, room, for example, I can do much more than just recording the signals of the bat. I can record, for example, uh, it's uh, uh, what we call beam steering, or uh, where it is allocating sensory attention. So you can see a bat here trained to land on a target in a uh, acoustic room. And these lines, so you can see its trajectory in blue, but these black lines that appear uh, whenever the bat emits sounds, they pick the center of the beam uh, of the bat. So you should imagine this acoustic beam, like a beam of a flashlight, for example. But of course, we're talking about sound waves in this case. And it has some kind of directionality. And apparently, the bat can also control where it directs its energy. Okay. Now, this is, in general, a very powerful tool for me to assess what the bat is attending sensorically. Uh, in this case, we also show that the bat, instead of pointing its beam straight, so uh, you could see it here maybe better. Instead of pointing its beam straight to the target, what the, what the bat was doing was pointing its beam to the right and to the left. And what we showed is that, it, that instead of pointing, so we have here the right beam and the left beam. And instead of pay, pointing the center of the uh, beam towards the target, it points the maximum derivative of the beam towards the target. And by this, it actually uh, reaches uh, uh, maximum sensitivity to changes in, uh, uh, in azimuth of uh, the target. You have a question? Sorry, just Perfect, exactly. So you could think of this. So these are all microphones. You could think of each of them as a pixel, you know, if this was an image. And we reconstruct, in this case, it's, it's 1D. So we could reconstruct a cross section through the beam of the bat, which is what you see over here. Uh, we now have a, a 2D array covering the entire, uh, uh, all, of the, all of the room. Uh, and what, we, what I show you here is you see this point within the beam is pointed towards the target. And this is the maximum derivative of the beam, so where energy changes uh, uh, most rapidly over angle. Okay, and and by using these, uh, so it can do this with one beam, but by using two beams, you double the uh, the derivative, so to say. Uh, so this is one strategy used uh, uh, by bats. Uh, another strategy used by bats in order to improve uh, their sensory acquisition is the following. Uh, in, case, in this case, we have the same array that you've seen uh, in, uh, in the previous slide, but, in, but here we put it in the field. So uh, you can imagine a small uh, pond of, uh, of water. So this is the Israeli desert. The pond is uh, 2 meters by 2 meters, something like that. And the reason why we have the array, these uh, circles here, the red circles, depict, depict our, our array. The reason why we have the array here is because we anticipate the bats. So they come to drink, and we can therefore uh, record and reconstruct their beams. Uh, 
remember this point because remember how limited we are. Later on, I will show you how we overcome this limitation. We can only record the bats with this system when they come near our uh, array. But if a bat indeed approaches our array, we can, we can reconstruct its flight trajectory. You can see here in blue a uh, reconstruction of movement based on sound only. So every time the bat emits sound, uh, the, uh, the same signal will arrive at the different microphones with different delays. And this allows us to reconstruct the position of the bat. And in this case, I also show you the beam of the bat, so not only the steering as I showed you before, but act an actual reconstruction of the, of the beam. And what you can notice is that the bat changes the width of the beam. So this would be equivalent to changing the field of view for us uh, humans, for example. You can see that when it goes down, it uh, narrows its field of view. And then when it uh, emerges from, so this is a, a small pond and there are banks, so it's going down between the banks and then flying out. Uh, and it increases or, or widens its field of view. And uh, we can try to interpret this. Perhaps it's trying to avoid echoes from the side. We can, there are many guesses for why uh, this uh, sensory behavior, behavior is beneficial. But how does it do this? It does this just simply by changing the aperture, ch change the, 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 changing its mouth gape. That's all it has to do. And we actually prove this by uh, fusing, using uh, imaging, by photographing the, the bat while they do this. You can see that a wide beam corresponds to a very narrow gape, and a, a narrow beam corresponds to a very uh, wide gape. So uh, since many people here do robotics, I want to show you our uh, take on robotics. We're much less interested, or we know much less about the motor side, which is what I think most people here are doing. We're much more interested in the sensory side. Uh, the students, by the way, are always uh, who are in charge of each project are always uh, on, the, on the slides. So here is our autonomous acoustic uh, vehicle. Uh, it is navigating through the botanical gardens in Tel Aviv University. It has a camera just for us to see where it is. There is no use of the camera. It's fully autonomous in, in, in the sense that everything is being computed on the, uh, on the robot itself in real time. Uh, what it does, it emits sounds. You can see two ears. There are two microphones. So there's a left ear and a right ear. And uh, whenever uh, it uh, detects an echo, it localizes it based on these uh, two uh, incoming uh, sensor inputs. It can then reconstruct a map. Again, this is based on the acoustics only of the botanical garden. So now you can see it uh, planning uh, its uh, path through the map that has been reconstruction, reconstructed. And it can even perform what I call simple decision making. So for example, if it uh, ends up in an area like this, where it is blocked from one side and blocked from, from, from in, in the front and on to the right. And on the left, there's some plants. So what the robot is now doing is to uh, acquire echoes of all, from all directions, run these echoes through a neural network, trying to, fi trying to find which of these uh, paths is free, or in other words, where, where is there a plant that it can go through? And as you see, we're not so good in the locomotion. We're better in the sensing. But in a second, it will manage to go through this uh, plant. Uh, and everything is uh, fully <laughs> autonomous. Yeah. Uh, how can we uh, classify objects based on sound? Maybe some of you are wondering after I showed you this, uh, these images. So here's some intuition to how we can do this. What I'm showing you now are spectrograms, not of a bat but rather of echoes. There are five uh, species of plants that are, that are presented. You can see one example of each. Uh, once again, frequency over time. And uh, uh, we ran this, uh, this data through a support vector machine. This was already many years ago before the neural networks uh, made their uh, renaissance. Uh, and we were able to classify uh, these different types of plants based on, the, on their echoes. Just to give you very simple intuition, I want to play back two sounds to you, the sound of an apple tree. So this is an apple tree. OK, of course, I have to downsample everything for you to hear. It's all ultrasonic. And this is a cornfield. OK, and I'm, I'm quite sure that you are now, for some reason, it was a bit short. Let me try to play it like this. Seems to be trimmed a little bit, but. OK, this was better. And I'm quite sure that if I run a short test right now, I'll play one of them, and you'll tell me what it is. Let's see. So I'll play this one. What is this? Cornfield. So everybody is now trained to detect cornfields according to the sound. How can you do it? It's easy. I gave you an easy example, but we could do it with all of them. You can clearly see, so time when using sonar equals distance. And you can see that we look, we can look with our sonar system into the cornfield. You can see the first, second, third, and fourth row, rows of the cornfield. Uh, so, and, and this is what you could hear. You could hear this, uh, uh, this segmented sound, choo -choo -choo, something like that. Uh, but we could also, and I can give you some more intuition, intuition to how you can classify some of the other echoes. And we could do it for all of them. Uh, 
before I uh, uh, move to talk, yeah. Yeah, in this case, it's a chirp. It's an FM chirp mimicking a bad signal. It's a very short uh, pulse between 100 kilohertz and, uh, and 20 kilohertz uh, modulated linearly in this case. Okay, so you're, you're embedding you're using a signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, uh, in terms of what are we doing new with robotics, except for all of these machine learning algorithms, I think uh, most uh, people using, not so many people use ultrasound robotics in air, uh, but the uh, ones who do use them for, uh, for example, range, uh, finders, and they're always using these very narrow banded pulses while, while we uh, uh, exploit the entire bandwidth just like uh, bats do. And you could hear it. When you, sound, when you heard that uh, apple tree, you could hear this because it's, uh, yeah, it's chirping from uh, high to low. Yeah. Sorry, so you said the bats do a frequency sweep of what number? So it depends on the species. And some bats will actually even use constant frequency signals. And they will uh, detect Doppler shifts created by the flutter of the wings of a moth. I will not elaborate on that unless you're interested. Uh, but uh, uh, most bats use FM chirps. The range can be between uh, bats that, uh, that use a bandwidth of 10 kilohertz between 30 and 20. And they expertise in, for example, hunting larger insects in open space. And some bats will use bandwidths of more than 100 kilohertz. So they will sweep from 200 kilohertz to, to 80 or 60. There's a huge variability. It depends on, uh, mostly on the environment in which they uh, hunt. Uh, and thanks to, to radar literature, we can also explain quite, uh, uh, quite uh, accurately, I would say, what's the purpose of each signal. Uh, so I'm, I'm about to switch to talking about movement. I just wanted to remind you that uh, bats are not only echolocators. They all use vision. We actually had a, a recent study showing that they can translate uh, translate maybe is a little bit too strong, but they can uh, create a visual representation based on acoustic information. So you can train them using echoes and then test them using vision. And they are able to perform a classification test. Uh, but in this case, I want to show you another sensory uh, system used by, uh, it's a tactile system, but I, I'm quite sure something you haven't heard of. And also very preliminary, I threw in these uh, images uh, yesterday. Uh, so some bats have a, a tail that uh, protrudes out of their membrane. Most, in most cases, the tail is part of the membrane. This is probably what the ancestral bat looked like. Uh, uh, we call this a greater mouse-tailed bat. And what this bat will do uh, when, uh, uh, when crawling up a crevice is to move its tail just like a, a blind uh, person uses a cane. Uh, probably in order to sense the, uh, uh, you know, the, the morphology of the, uh, of the crevice. I'll show you uh, a moving, not perfect. You'll see uh, the quality is not perfect. You'll see this bat crawling up this uh, uh, wall that we created. And here we are tracking uh, the tail. OK, so you can see how the tail is moving right, left, right, left. We are now analyzing the kinematics, what is going on. We, I can already tell you that it's a, a theta uh, a kind of uh, 8 hertz uh, a rhythm. And in parallel to doing this, we're also MRI scanning the bat's brain in order to understand uh, the somatosensory representation of this area in the bat's somatosensory cortex. Is it large? Is it small? Um, OK, so just to. Uh, is it strong? Can it prevent pitchback? Often tail, which prevent pitchback? I don't think so. I don't think so. It also has this, uh, by the way, it reminded me uh, when I saw the elephant talk yesterday, it also has this, these small hairs protruding at the end of the tail, uh, which might be related maybe to sensing, I don't know, flow when it's flying or something like that. Uh, an unknown sensory system, uh, or unexplored, it has been known for many years, sensory system that uh, some bats uh, use. Uh, OK, so I'm going, as I, as I promised, I'm going to switch to talking about uh, movement and uh, especially uh, about how bats use the social information in order to make these decisions that I mentioned. But in order to study this, we really want to study the animals in their natural environment. Most of what I've shown you so far was in the lab. And in order to study the animals in the natural environment, we had to develop these uh, tiny sensors that can be mounted on the animals because bats are very small. So most bat species, by the way, there are 1,300 species of bats in the world. Most of them weigh less than 50 grams. The smallest mammal on Earth is a bat weighing 1.5 grams. Some people will say it's a shrew, but it doesn't matter. If it's, even if it's number two, it's still uh, uh, respect to this bat. Uh, but uh, uh, what we had to develop, because there were no small enough sensors at the time, we developed our own miniature GPS uh, uh, loggers. 
uh, which also come with a microphone. That's super important for us, right? We want to record sound on the animal. At the moment, I, I'm still not aware of other sensors that include a GPS and a microphone together. Today, there are quite a few small GPS devices, but I think none of them have microphones. Currently, we can also perform additional recordings uh, using the sensor, so we can record acceleration. You can see in red here the wing beat of the bat. So this is Z acceleration. You can uh, detect the wing beat, and you can see how echolocation in blue is synchronized with wing beat. Uh, we can do physiology. We've recorded ECG on flying bats, EEG on flying bats, uh, and uh, and also uh, we can do we can measure ambient uh, parameters such as temperature or body temperature as well. Uh, what do we get when recording sound? I think some of this you will now already uh, recognize since I gave you an introduction. Um, so one of the most important things for this talk is our ability to record conspecifics. Okay? So look at this spectrogram. This is a different bat with a different signal, by the way, following your question. Look at this signal. Very different from what, I'm show what I've showed you before. It's a multi-harmonic signal. And uh, in, in red, I circled calls that are weaker than the ones emitted by the bat carrying the device, these signals are emitted by a conspecific. So a bat flying, the same species flying near my bat, and now I can study the interactions between them. I can also study foraging. I will not uh, talk about this too much today, but for example, here we can see an attack. You've seen this before, right? The intervals become shorter, the calls become shorter, the uh, bandwidth, uh, uh, in this case, uh, decreases. Uh, uh, sometimes when I study foraging, I can also say what is being attacked. For example, here we work on a frog-eating bat in Panama. We know that the bat attacked the frog because we also recorded the frog signals just before the attack. You know, the frog, the male frog, is calling for the female to find it, similar to the moths with the pheromones. And in this case, we know that this was the last call ever emitted by the frog because we have the chewing sounds right after the attack. So. The idea is really that we can now quantify foraging success in completely uh, wild animals. For example, we could compare uh, uh, maneuverability of individuals to foraging success. But there are many ideas, and uh, we're still working on this. So uh, what I do want to uh, show you is uh, a few things about how uh, bats move in groups and why they move in groups. So some bat species exhibit uh, this type of uh, behavior. What you see here are the same greater mouse tail bats that I showed you before. What you're listening to are social calls. This is social communication, not echolocation. This was a kestrel, by the way, that was trying to grab one of the bats. This is a very dangerous moment in the life of a bat uh, because the bats are aggregating outside the cave and they're about to swarm out. Okay, so as I said, some bat species will show this behavior, uh, or many maybe I should say, but not all. And uh, these bats will now fly together for uh, several kilometers, and uh, what happens later we, don't, we, we didn't know, let's say, until we, put, uh, we placed GPS uh, devices on these bats. Okay, so uh, I'll say very briefly that we found that these bats uh, move together uh, in groups uh, throughout the night, and I want to take you, because I don't think I have a, a enough time, I want to take you to a, a, to a different system with a similar problem. Okay, so what is the problem? Maybe I'll say one more, one more word about this problem. These bats hunt for ephemeral uh, food. What do I mean by this? They don't eat uh, fruit, uh, they don't eat insects that are easy to predict, in, uh, their location is easy to predict. predict. They hunt uh, uh, queen ants performing nocturnal nuptial flights. Okay? So this is something that is probably very hard to predict, uh, and we also show it in our paper. And uh, once you find it, there is a lot of food. Okay? And now, by saying this, I will take you uh, to uh, another species that has a very similar problem. This is the Mexican fish-eating bat, uh, which uh, uh, lives on these uh, small islands in the center of uh, the Sea of Cortez. And why did we think that it has a similar problem? Uh, that is because this is the, probably the only bat that forages on fish and crustaceans in the ocean. There are several bats that will forage uh, near the shore or in rivers, but this is probably the only one that really goes out at sea, uh, sometimes dozens of kilometers out at sea. I'll show you in a second. Uh, and, and the problem is really, really difficult. You have to find a flock uh, or school right, of fish or crustaceans in this uh, huge uh, ocean with very uh, few uh, cues. So we started tracking this uh, bat, and for the first time, we, we could say what it is doing, so where it is moving. And indeed, as I said, we found that it can fly sometimes dozens of kilometers uh, offshore. This is one individual, different nights. By the way, you can see here nicely, uh, I would say carefully, a levy-like behavior. You can see how the behavior changes when there is food, and then you can see longer uh, um, trajectories without turning, but I'll, I'll be very careful. We didn't quantify it, and it's difficult to quantify levy-like movement. Um, 
And uh, there are many interesting questions, uh, such as uh, how do they find food and how do they navigate? So notice that it looks like the bats know exactly where they're going. They go back to this tiny island, one kilometer radius over. They fly very low, one to two meters above uh, uh, sea level in completely dark uh, night sometimes, with moonless night. Uh, I've been out at sea. You cannot see the island from anywhere. So it is uh, uh, unclear to me uh, how can they find their way back to the island. Maybe Anna will have some ideas in her talk uh, later on. But what we uh, addressed in this study is how uh, do they find food in this island, in this uh, sorry environment. And what we found is that they constantly move in groups. So I'll show you now a movie that shows the uh, movement of several bats. And every time, so the island is over here, and you'll see the full night of each bat. Mostly they do something like this. This is still a huge area. There's no scale here. But this is something like 15 kilometers by 30 kilometers that they have to scan uh, for fish, for food. And uh, wherever there is a, a white circle, this means that there is a nearby bat, a conspecific nearby. How do I know this? Based on the microphone, I already explained before. And you'll notice when there's a red circle, it means that they found food and they're attacking food, again, again based on the microphone. But you'll notice how they constantly move with bats uh, around them. So they are constantly part uh, of a group. I should say that my microphone is not as sensitive as a bat. I can pick up another bat from up to 20 meters, so that's why I only have white circles part of the time, but the bats can probably eavesdrop on other bats from up to 150 meters. Okay, so if I had the ability of the bat, you would probably see white circles all of the time. Okay, so what do they gain from a, a moving in a group? Here is a, a schematic that tries to explain uh, what is the benefit of uh, moving in a group? So uh, again, you have to remember that we're looking for prey that is ephemeral, hard to find, but uh, abundant. Once you find it, there's a lot of food. It's not as if you're competing uh, with neighbors on food or there's less competition, let's say. And what we think is going on is that uh, the bats spread uh, uh, as a group and eavesdrop on other bats, right? So once another bat finds the food, Everybody within eavesdrop range, which could, which could be up to 150 meters, knows that this other bat found food, right? How does it know? I showed you before. When a bat uh, attacks food, the sequence of calls becomes very stereotypic. The calls shorten, the intervals shorten, so on uh, and so on. Uh, so we call this the bag of chips effect. Why? Because if I turn off the lights uh, in this uh, hall and somebody, let's say, over here opens a bag of chips, everybody knows immediately, it's anonymous, nobody knows who opened the bag of chips, but everybody knows that there is food uh, over here. Same with the bats, they cannot uh, conceal this. Now, importantly, the self-detection range, when you use sonar and you're searching for an insect, for example, um, your own detection range is extremely limited in air, okay? Because of these high frequencies, you can only find an insect from a, a few meters. Some people would say 10 meters, uh, but that's probably the, the largest people would uh, uh, estimate. So you're extremely limited, but if you spread an eavesdrop, you can increase your uh, uh, searching uh, area. And we actually use this uh, commonly used uh, three ready uh, model Right, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with this model where you have uh, three, each individual uh, has three radii. So it's an agent-based model. Uh, so if there's an agent next to you within this uh, radius, you are repelled by it. You move uh, to the other, in the other direction. Then there's a, an alignment radius uh, which, uh, in which you align your movement to the movement of other individuals. And then there's a, an attraction um, radius for in which you uh, are attracted to other bats and, uh, or to other agents. And uh, we use this, uh, uh, as I said, commonly used model in order to test our hypothesis that this type of searching uh, would be beneficial for the bats. And indeed, what you see here is a simulation. Uh, you can see the bats leaving their island. There is the food is sparse and ephemeral. There's uh, only food uh, over here. They form these groups uh, autonomously. So the, the only thing they do is to behave according to this set of rules that, I, that I've uh, explained. And you see that groups form. Uh, sometimes they split, sometimes they rejoin. And in a second, you'll see that uh, uh, one of the groups finds the food. And then notice what happens when this group uh, approaches the food. So each individual here can only hear individuals within 150 meters. So this individual now found food. This guy has no, no sense of the food being found. It's only following the guys in front of it. And still, we find that using this very simple set of rules, something like 80%, you see not everybody, 80% of the individuals in the uh, group will converge onto the food. So, and we really show that this is uh, uh, much more beneficial than uh, searching uh, individually. 
We're also now in the process of building these uh, swimming robots. As you see, we're avoiding flight. We're uh, either on the ground or in the water. We, we don't want to deal with flight because, as I said, I don't know, I don't know much about motors. But we want to, uh, we're in the process of building a, a, a group of uh, swimming bots that will behave sensorically, just like I have now explained, uh, hoping to see this, this same type of behavior uh, emerging uh, based on this uh, simple set of, uh, of rules. So in the third part of my talk, this was uh, about how bats use information in a group. In the third part of the, my talk, I will try to touch on, on mechanisms a little bit uh, more deeply. And I will start by talking about uh, how do bats navigate, OK? So uh, the bats that I showed you before, those Mexican fish eating bats, first of all, their task is, is to search. So it is not very clear where they are going. And we don't know much about their navigation. But uh, I will now talk about fruit bats that uh, um, return to the same fruit trees night after night. And for them, it is easier at least to, to think that we understand where they are going and to study their navigation. Now, the problem with studying navigation with wild animals is the fact that you don't know their history. Or maybe let me say, sorry, let me say, uh, let, let me rephrase. The problem with testing the idea of maps uh, uh, in animals uh, is uh, in the wild is the fact that you don't know their history. So there is this uh, hypothesis that some animals have uh, perhaps maps, what we call cognitive maps. They can map the, the environment and they, can, uh, they have some kind of a mental map in their uh, brain. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of uh, cognitive maps is the ability to move between uh, two points, two familiar points, using an unfamiliar, relatively straight uh, trajectory. Okay, so think of yourself. You want to move from uh, here to, I don't know, the, the train station in Trieste. And if you've created a map of this area, uh, you can do this with a relatively, here it would be easy because you have the shore, but a relatively uh, straight uh, line, even if you have never traveled uh, in this uh, trajectory before. So what do I mean by history? Here's a bat that we tracked for uh, almost 100 days. Um, I need to say that bats uh, are long-lived. They can live up to 30, even 40 years, much, much longer than any other mammal with a similar size. And look at what this bat is doing. Uh, for something like 20 nights, it flies uh, uh, to point A, something like 25 kilometers away from the roost. This is the roost. And then it, it flies to point uh, B uh, for several uh, nights. And then it, fl it, fl it flies to point C for several nights. And then at some point around nine si night 60, it performs this shortcut, right, in yellow, this clear shortcut. Uh, this is uh, uh, something like 10 kilometers, so, and it's dark, it's night. It's hard to believe that it can beacon, that it can see uh, point uh, C from point B. Uh, so it looks like a map, right? Uh, but the problem is that I don't know the history of this bat, right? I caught it at some point during its lifetime. It can be one year old. Well, it's not one year old, I know that, but it could be five year old, it could be 30 years old, and I have no idea if this is really a, a novel shortcut. So in order to overcome this problem, we invented the following method. We developed uh, our own bat colony. So when I say develop our own bat colony, we simply opened the window in our bot bat colony, and we hoped that the bats will come back. And indeed, many of these bats come back. These are fruit bats. The colony is uh, here in Tel Aviv University. It's the first academic uh, colony of bats in the world, I think. And what you can see here are three nights uh, uh, in the life of one individual outside the colony. Uh, each night is depicted by a different color. And, and very fascinating for me is that already on the second night outside, this bat goes to uh, sleeps over at friends. So you can see it finds a colony nearby our colony. The, the area is full of colonies, full of fruit bat colonies. They are very successful in the city. Uh, so she sleeps over uh, 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 in this colony and then comes back uh, to our colony. But the main thing about this method is that it now allows us, when we study pups, to uh, monitor the full history of the animal. So you will now see 50 nights continuously in the life of uh, one individual from the day uh, it left the colony for the first time. Uh, the nights uh, are color coded from blue to red. You can see that there are many uh, ex short exploitatory, so the colony is over here. There are many short exploitatory uh, trajectories when she flies nearby to a familiar tree. And there are also often these uh, extreme exploratory trajectories where she probably is increasing, in this case, it's not a she, it's a he. Uh, he is increasing its, uh, its knowledge about the area. But now, for example, when it arrives here and then comes back, I know that it has never, so if we're looking at, at the yellow trajectory, I know because the red is later, we, I know that it's, it has never been in this region before, okay? The closest it, it has been to it is several kilometers uh, away. I have a kind of technical question. Uh, 
question. Yeah. GPS is using a lot of energy. Yeah. So. Uh, so what do you do? You will charge the bat or the, the bat? Yeah. So in the future, uh, uh, we hope to charge them through induction. So they will each will land on its port and will charge itself. At the moment, we don't have that. And that's exactly why we needed this colony. Uh, because if I now try to work in the wild, I can place a GPS. It will work for two nights. And then I can dream of catching the same bat again and again and again. In this colony, we can catch them every three, three nights, for example, and change the battery. Sorry, and how do you collect the data? So the data is logged. Uh, it is not transmitted, again, due to energetic uh, considerations. And again, these are exactly the two main reasons why we needed this colony. We can just uh, remove, the, remove the tag, put a new tag, and, uh, yeah. and the bats get used to this. And uh, not all of them stay, by the way. Many, I would say, only 30% of them stay. Uh, but it's enough for us to get a good sample size. Uh, yeah. As I said, these are fruit bats. So we can also map the fruit trees where they prefer and they return to these trees uh, uh, often, although not always. I will talk about this uh, later if I still have time. Uh, so we know something about where they are heading, right? We think at least that we know. And uh, here's to the main uh, question. So do, do they perform shortcuts? So in black here, I apologize for the black color. Um, you can see a novel, a truly novel shortcut. How do I know that it's truly novel? In blue, you can see what this bat did during the night before performing the shortcut. Uh, so this is a foraging tree, and this is the roost. And then in, uh, uh, in uh, white, you can see everything that this bat, the entire history of this bat. So everything that it did before, and you can see that it never uh, performed this type of uh, this movement. So it was even, it, it hardly ever uh, has been to this uh, area before. Uh, we have uh, detected several, uh, something like 100, and uh, ah, here it's written 125 shortcuts here, uh, some more. Uh, examples, uh, and all of them are, as I said, novel. Are they straight? Are they direct? So here we quantify the straight, straightness of the, uh, of the trajectories of these shortcuts using the straightest index. So it's the ratio between uh, 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 how much you actually travel in the straight line. So one would mean, would mean straight. Uh, commute flights. Commute means the bat uh, re uh, uses a trajectory that has already been used. So you expect it to be very, very straight. And indeed, you see that it's uh, close to one. And shortcuts uh, are also very straight, as you can see over here. So the bats are flying straight between these two uh, familiar locations. If you look at what we call exploration, exploration means you're moving to a point where you have not been before. And you can see that the straight straightness is uh, much, much lower. And it's the same for some a model that uh, we try to, uh, in which we try to mimic the bat using some correlated walk. If you look at the angle, the heading angle at the moment where the bats take off uh, from, the, from point A, let's say, to point B while performing shortcuts, you can see that they are di distributed uh, very different from a uniform distribution, and they're narrow or around zero. And again, they cannot be explained. This distribution cannot be explained by some kind of a correlated random rock movement. So the bats seem to know where they're going uh, from uh, uh, the moment that they uh, start. Uh, we also detected what we call uh, long cuts. What do I mean by long cut? It's a term we invented. So if you look at this bat, uh, it, so everything it, does, it, it, has, it did before is within this uh, home range, what we call home range down here. And then it performs this long exploratory flight in blue and uh, uh, reaching very large distances far from wherever it has ever been. And it is also able to return to, uh, in this case, a fruit tree, in some cases, the colony from uh, these uh, very large uh, distances outside its familiar home range. Uh, and once again, we detected uh, something like 100 such uh, long cuts. And once again, these long cuts are, uh, are very straight, not as straight as shortcuts, but much straighter than uh, any exploratory behavior or any uh, model. And once again, the animals know where they're going at the moment when they take off. What about the ontogeny of the ability to perform shortcuts and long cuts? So there seems to be uh, no difference between night one outside and over time. So what we see here are days outside. And what's the uh, rate of performing shortcuts and long cuts? And this is just noise. I don't think there's any pattern here. The, the bats can do it from day one outside. By the way, day one outside is not, they're not, it's not day one in their life. Usually they're around four weeks when they start uh, 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 sorry, around eight weeks old when they start flying outside. Uh, but from that day onwards, there's no increase in the rate of shortcuts um, or, or long cuts. However, there is an increase in the, the, the length of the shortcuts of, and the, and the, and the uh, long cuts. And I think this makes perfect sense. The ability is there. But when you map more and more uh, uh, of the region, then you can perform longer shortcuts and um, long cuts. 
what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, sensory system, which sensory modality is being used to perform this navigation is the next uh, question I, I'm about to answer. Uh, so it has been already proposed by uh, Asaf Tso, who was a study of Ran, who will talk uh, later on today, that these bats uh, use, uh, these same fruit bats use uh, vision uh, when navigating in uh, rural areas. Uh, so to test this uh, hypothesis, we performed uh, several, uh, several things in order to test this hypothesis. And I'll bring you a few points that I think suggest that the bats are indeed using vision. Once again, I remind you, many people think that bats are blind. So in this case, not only they're not blind, they probably rely on vision for navigation. And I believe that many bats probably do this. Uh, here are a few points that I think suggest the visual based uh, navigation and a visual based map. So what you see here is a correlation between the distance of the shortcut and the altitude of the bat. So when the bats return from larger distances or perform longer shortcuts, they will elevate, they will ascend to higher altitudes before performing the uh, the return, uh, if you're using a magnetic sense or, uh, or I don't know about olfaction, we can argue about it later, uh, probably it doesn't make much sense to ascend. Uh, why should they ascend? So I will show you now. Uh, so most of the time, these bats are flying very low, less than 10 meters. This is an urban environment. And here is what you see when you fly at this, uh, uh, these low altitudes. So I'm showing you drone images taken by drones flying at the same altitude of the bats at the same locations, 11 locations uh, flown by, by our bats. This is what you see. OK, so basically, can you see or should I turn off the light? Turn off the light? OK. Huh. I think I know how to do that. Uh -huh. OK, apparently I know. So essentially, you see nothing right? when you fly at these heights. I mean, there are no visual uh, landmarks that can be used unless you're doing some kind of a template uh, matching uh, uh, algorithm. Okay? So what we would expect is that the height of the bats, the, the height the bats are sent to before performing a long cut and short cut will be correlated to the height of the buildings around them. Right? And that's what we find. Okay? We find a significant positive correlation between the height of the buildings uh, around the bats and the height they ascend to when performing uh, these shortcuts and long cuts. What do you gain by, by surpassing the buildings? I'll show you in a second exactly what you gain. So this is a bat, this is a drone, mimicking a bat moving from its foraging grounds, which are down there, to the height it ascended to before. So this is the height it ascended to over here before returning to the colony. And what you re once you reach the height, this is the height, you only have to pass the buildings. This is what you can now see. Okay, so there's a huge urban horizon with a lot of landmarks. I immediately recognize them, of course, you do not. But uh, I, I can point out the direction of the, of the colony just by using these uh, distal uh, urban uh, landmarks. Uh, we also quantified this. We took a drone to uh, uh, 20 locations where the bats ascended to. We uh, recognized several uh, salient uh, landmarks that we guessed could be meaningful. And indeed, in all cases, uh, the bats, uh, uh, by ascending, you can see uh, many more of these landmarks than you could if you did not uh, ascend. Last point I want to, uh, to make on this uh, uh, story is related to individuality, which is something that was not uh, yet much mentioned in this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, and that is the fact that uh, you know, different bats have, uh, uh, sometimes people will call it personalities, uh, have simple personalities or, or behavioral traits, some people would say. Uh, and we wondered how can this influence uh, their navigation? And uh, what do I mean by uh, personality in terms of navigation? So here you can see three individual bats. And all of them, the tracks of all of them on day 80 outside are shown. So there's no difference in the time they spent outside. Look at this individual, how exploratory it is. I think it's the same one I showed you the movie of at the beginning. The beginning. And look at this individual, which is our least exploratory bat. Basically, all it did is to leave the colony, fly to a nearby tree, and come back. Okay? So we were guessing that if you indeed, and here we quantify, this is just the home range uh, sorted according to individuals. And we were guessing that if uh, 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 you indeed have to map the environment, this will also affect your ability uh, to navigate. And in order to test this, we performed the translocation experiment, which is very common in the navigation literature, in which you take the animal to a new location and you release it where it has ho hopefully never been. In our case, since we knew exactly where these animals have been before, we could actually validate that we uh, release them in a point that they have never been uh, to. 
and, uh, and it, it did not have to be very far. So we took them only five kilometers away, but we knew they've never been there. And uh, indeed, look at this exploratory bat uh, released five kilometers from the colony. By the way, all bats have been released in two points. So here on the coast and here in the center of the city. And look how this exploratory bat, how easily it homes back to the colony in blue, uh, while this uh, individual coral was released. Uh, this is the least exploratory individual released here on the coast. She clearly had no idea where she's going, right? She flies uh, straight into the, uh, into the Mediterranean Sea. And then at some point, she realizes that uh, something is wrong. Uh, and uh, heads uh, back and then returns. By the way, I cannot really explain how, how she uh, returns. She, should, she must have somehow used the uh, uh, landmarks while flying uh, over here to, to uh, assess the direction, the azimuth of the colony. If you're asking yourself, and this is indeed repeatable, I didn't show you the graph, but you can see a nice correlation between your exploratory tendency and your straightness of homing. Uh, and if you're asking yourself what happened uh, over here at this point, so now I overlay the altitude of the bat on the same trajectory, and you can see that she's climbing. Uh, this is only 50 meters, but there's a cliff uh, over here. And if I interpret uh, what's going on in her mind, so she's flying, and at some point she looks back, and she realizes, oops, the city is over there, and uh, this is this point, and then she turns and, uh, and, and descends and goes back to the colony. So what do I think is going on? I already hinted on this before. I think it's a visual map. Uh, I think it's based on triangulation of, uh, uh, of uh, salient uh, landmarks, uh, buildings, but also maybe junctions, maybe highways as well. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the bats can use this in order to estimate their azimuth uh, to the, the, the desired azimuth, sorry, towards their destination. Maybe also distance. I don't know. We're testing. Uh, I mean, something about the distance they know for sure. Here's just a, a nice example uh, um, uh, to, to show to prove that this has to be uh, an, uh, um, an angle, a point of view, independent based representation. So here's a bat, and this happens very often. So uh, the home range of the bats is over here. Almost the city is here, so the landmarks are down here. And now this bat finds itself south to these landmarks for the first time. And this happens a lot, even in that movie that I showed you. Uh, so suddenly, the arrangement of the landmarks reverses. You can see this is what she's seen, she's seen before, and this is what she sees it, uh, how she sees it now. Everything's reversed. And the distances, the angular distances between them, of course, have changed completely because she's far down here. And still, she finds her way, or it finds its way back to a tree or, a colon, or the colony. Um, uh, without any problems. Uh, the last thing I think I want to show you, uh, because I'm running out of time, is uh, uh, we're trying now to quantify how can they use these visual landmarks to navigate. I gave you some kind of intuition, but we're trying to quantify it more accurately. For that, we're using bats that navigate in these rural areas, uh, because there's just simply, there's, I think, less information than in the city, where it's very, very difficult. And what we're doing is, what we did, actually, is to fly a drone in the exact flight trajectory of the bat, collecting visual information from the point of view of the bat. So this is the trajectory. The bat, uh, this is something like a 20-kilometer trajectory. The bat leaves its roost and flies to a tree uh, 20 kilometers away. This is the information available. So it's flying towards the coast in Israel. And uh, it, of course, at no point can see the tree, which is 20 kilometers down there. Uh, all it can see is, the, is these uh, background uh, lights. Uh, and what we've done is to run this through a, a machine learning, through a, a neural, an artificial neural network, a convolutional uh, network, that uh, uh, the task of the network is to receive an image and to, uh, as an output, to uh, point towards the direction, the right direction, the direction of the target. Uh, and indeed, the network can learn this uh, very, very um, precisely, so with very little uh, angular uh, error. But we did even more than that. So, after collecting the data along the trajectory of the bat, we moved uh, several kilometers away from the trajectory to these green, uh, sorry, blue points, uh, up to five kilometers away. And we collected visual information in these points on a completely different night, by the way. And now we're asking ourselves, can the same network now predict the direction of uh, uh, the target? And indeed, it can. So you can see, uh, this is just uh, an illustration because it's something, again, we're, just, we're, we're now trying to write it up. But let's say the bat uh, drifted or for some reason found itself a few kilometers off a uh, route. And it is now looking in this direction. This is the image that it is uh, seeing. We put this uh, as a, we insert this to the network as an input. And the output points towards the target uh, with an uh, uh, accuracy of several uh, degrees. So this could explain how 
uh, how they navigate. As we discussed uh, two days ago or yesterday, I think uh, these neural networks are black boxes. So what exactly is it using is something we will have, have to work hard to understand. Uh, the final point that I want to make is that uh, I want to say something about the ecology of the animal. Uh, I've shown you two very different types of navigation. Okay, So I showed you these rural bats. I've, you've seen a few examples of them that fly in straight lines night after night following the same trajectories, very boring navigation if you wish. And I showed you how uh, urban bats move. And this is what you see down here. And it's very, very different, OK? So they're much more diverse in their behavior. Some people would say they are bar hoppers, right? They move between trees on consecutive nights. They move within the same night. They will move from one tree to the other. Uh, so this uh, notion that their uh, use of navigation is very, very different uh, made us think that maybe something in their brain has also uh, adjusted to these different uh, types of uh, navigation. I'm not talking evolutionarily. I'm, I'm talking about behavioral uh, and, and neural plasticity in this, this case. Many, many of you maybe are familiar with the uh, taxi driver uh, um, findings in, uh, in London. So what we do very briefly is we MRI the animals uh, and we compare city and rural uh, bats. And we also compare uh, uh, rural bats that are brought into the city and uh, we compare their uh, brains before and after several weeks in an urban-like environment. And indeed, we find uh, uh, um, differences that uh, could reflect uh, uh, neural plasticity in areas that are related to navigation, such as the hippocampus and intorhinal cortex, uh, and uh, in sensory areas, and also in parts of the limbic system, such as uh, uh, the amygdala. Uh, I think I don't have time, so I will skip the last story. And I will just, ah. I want to invite all of you, and invitations will come somehow. Uh, I, I hopefully, you will be on some email list that, uh, uh, that, uh, that will receive this invitation. In uh, March uh, 2020, in the Weizmann Institute in Israel, we're organizing a big uh, conference on active sensing uh, that will include people from many different dip disciplines working on uh, active sensing, whisking, echolocation, electrolocation, active vision, and robotics as well. I think many people in this crowd are extremely relevant for this uh, meeting. And now I want to thank uh, a lot of students who uh, collected all of this uh, data and collaborators and funding agencies. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>